Hello. In this video, I want to explore the idea that judicial review can be understood in terms of its tasks, and the related idea that there is in academic writing on administrative law a clash of styles, to use Martin Laughlin's expression, and that one of the things that distinguishes these different styles is their sense of the task of judicial review. Now, I should at the outset give the mandatory health warning to think about any area of law or any institution in terms of its function is controversial. I won't try and defend my approach. I think that this is one of these situations where the proof of the pudding is in the eating. In other words, you can judge the approach in terms of the content of the insights it gives into the field rather than in the abstract. But just to anticipate what is coming, I should let you know that towards the end of this video, I will be drawing on the grid group cultural theory of anthropologist Mary Douglas, but there is no need to get into the underpinnings of that theory in any de detail. So what could we say are the tasks of judicial review? I will offer four different understandings of the tasks. My argument is that these different understandings are all present in the discourse of Canadian administrative law, although not all could be said to be orthodox understandings. And I would also argue that academic and judicial disagreements about administrative law often come down to the priority different styles of scholarship assign to different tasks. So let's list them. The first task of judicial review we can call vindicatory. This encapsulates the idea that judicial review is about policing the boundaries of, of official power and protecting private individuals against harms arising from unlawful administrative behaviour, as well as defending individual rights and liberties. This task also encompasses vindicating the values inherent in the common law and the constitution. And because this conception of the task is vindicatory, it stresses the remedial aspect of judicial review. It is about granting redress and in particular the forms of redress that are available through the courts. This conception of the task has a long tradition derived from the Dicean view of English administrative law and it is the conception which was associated with the Canadian courts in the early years of the 20th century. At that time, the courts showed tremendous hostility to new social programmes and to the administrative agencies and tribunals that were set up to administer them. The National Labour Relations Act, which established a National Labour Relations Board to oversee a system of collective bargaining, distinct from the traditional legal conception of employment rights, is an example. Although this is no longer seen as the overriding task of judicial review, it still has an important part to play in Canadian administrative law. As the textbook Van Harten et al says, most people would agree that an important function of administrative law, including the contribution of the courts, is the vindication of the rule of law. Well, I am not most people. And although I recognise the priority given to this task in Canadian administrative law, there are different ways of thinking about the tasks of judicial review or cognate legal procedures. This brings me to the second task of judicial review that I shall call mediatory. And it is perhaps best explained by introducing you to one of my favourite administrative law scholars, W.A. Robson. Robson wrote one of the first books on English administrative law called A Justice and Administrative Law. And the title was revealing in that justice comes before administrative law. Robson saw that the administrative state had brought great improvements to the lives of the many people who benefited from public programmes. The task of administrative law for Robson was not to defend the rights of the individual as traditionally understood against the expansion of the administrative state, but to ensure that the powers entrusted to state bodies, such as ministers or administrative tribunals, were exercised with a judicial mindset or in a spirit of justice, to use another phrase that Robson was fond of. 
Accepting that the conception of justice underpinning public programmes may differ from the sense of justice of, say, the property owner who was ordered by a local authority to make improvements to his rental property. So we can speak of this conception of the task of administrative law as mediatory, bringing into dialogue and resolving conflicts between different constitutionalisms and expectations of the power and obligations of government. I will give an example of this task, and it comes from the US case of United States versus AT&T, the telecommunications company. The case concerned a dispute between the US House of Representatives and the executive branch, which refused to authorise the release of certain documents in possession of the telecom company to a committee of the House. Here's what administrative law scholar David Feldman says about the case, and I'm quoting from his inaugural lecture at Cambridge. The court considered that each party was acting in a non-arbitrary way on the basis of a thoroughly sustainable view of its own constitutional powers and obligations. It was not for the court to adjudicate on a clash of constitutional absolutes. So the court in fact ordered mediation, which eventually solved the issue. This is a particularly pure and indeed literal example of a court taking a mediatory approach. But you might argue that you can see a similar judicial philosophy underpinning the Canadian court's functional and pragmatic approach to the review of legality of decisions, which recognises that it is sufficient that an, that an administrative tribunal's interpretation of the law is reasonable rather than correct. As the majority of the Supreme Court put it in Dunsmuir, reasonableness is a deferential standard. Certain questions that come before administrative tribunals do not lend themselves to one specific particular result. Instead, they may give, give rise to a number of possible reasonable conclusions. So the principle is that where a reasonableness standard is the correct one, if an agency's decision for, falls within the range of defensible outcomes, then it will stand, provided that it is justified, transparent and intelligible. The third conception of the task I call hortatory. P.S. Atiyah talked about the hortatory function of law, meaning its role in encouraging or discouraging behaviour. So the hortatory task of administrative law involves engaging in a process of institutional dialogue to develop and enforce compliance with principles of good governance and setting out the constitutional obligations and expectations of administrative authorities. A British scholar whose work encapsulates the hortatory approach is arguably J.D.B. Mitchell, who spoke about the role of administrative law as the conscience of the administration and administrative law as a new administrative equity. Now, this is a little bit like the mediatory approach in that it involves a dialogue with the administration, but it sees a more authoritative role for the court in laying down specific standards. And as the module progresses, you will see that this approach too is influential in Canadian administrative law. For example, in setting out the requirements of fair procedures. So when the courts lay down instructions concerning, for example, when an administrative tribunal has to conduct an oral in-person hearing before making a decision, or how the tribunal personnel must conduct themselves before the parties, they are taking a hortatory approach. The final task of administrative law we can call executory, that is enforcing and implementing decisions of policy taken by the legislature or by an executive authority with policy making priority against intrusion by other administrative authorities. And in an article with T.T. Arvin, The Curious Origins of Judicial Review, which you will read for the first seminar, I set out why I think the administrative law judgments of Lord Diplock in the 1970s and 1980s put this task at the heart of English administrative law. You could think of this task as related to an umpire or line judge function, and it is particularly important in Canada given its federal structure. For example, in Cravier, a case we will discuss in detail in due course, 
The Quebec legislature established a professions tribunal to deal with appeals from the decisions of its professional tribunals. But the Supreme Court of Canada held that this was contrary to the allocation of judicial power set out in section 96 of the Constitution. That is the quintessential example of the executory task of administrative law. So those in very brief outline are my perspective on the four tasks of judicial review. Now, to see how they fit together and stand apart from one another, we can make use of a scheme based on Mary Douglas's grid group theory. But instead of talking about group, I am going to talk about concord and discord society. And instead of grid, I'm going to talk about formal and substantive legal reasoning. And these categories can be used to show commonalities and differences between the four conceptions of the task of administrative law. So we can think of a two-dimensional axis. The horizontal axis captures different views about the nature of society. At one end, society is viewed as discordant, with politics being a realm of conflict, bargaining and agreement, to use Robert Dahl's phrase. At this end of the, the spectrum, there is no settled public interest, just different individual and group interests that sometimes form into coalitions, but usually only for a while. At the other end, we have Concord society, in which society is regarded as having, or at least capable of having, common goals and a settled purpose, so that we can meaningfully speak in terms of the public interest or the public good which can inform decisions in administrative law. The other dimension captures the style of legal reasoning. At one end, we have formalism or formal rationality. This is a style of legal reasoning which emphasizes the autonomy, consistency and coherence of the rules of administrative law. Legal doctrine is not about solving practical social problems. In fact, as Fred Schauer, one of the acolytes of formalism puts it, within the formalist way of thinking, the whole point of legal doctrine is to rule out of consideration factors that a judge might otherwise want to take into consideration. And this might include the policy implications. At the other end of the scale, legal reasoning is very much about solving practical problems. In an administrative law context, this would suggest a style which explicitly involves a re-examination of case law with a view to improving the outcomes which the law is designed to promote. And I'm channeling American administrative lawyer K.C. Davis here, and to making policy choices when the statute is silent or unclear as to what the, those outcomes are or should be. So fitting the four tasks into this framework, I suggest that the traditional vindicatory conception of the task of judicial review is low grade, low group, or in the terms we use here is a substantively rational approach that presupposes a discord view of society. The mediatory conception is also substantively rational. It takes a substantive problem solving role for law, but it assumes a society that is basically harmonious so that it is possible to mediate between different views. The hortatory approach shares the mediatory conception's concord view of society, but takes a more formalist approach to legal reasoning, while the executory approach, which is also formalist, shares with the vindicatory approach a discordant view of society. If these categories seem unfamiliar and strange, don't worry for now. We'll come back to them later on in the module. But I think you will find this scheme helpful when we start to tackle the different decisions of the courts and the different writings of administrative law scholars. Try to identify the implicit assumptions about the task of judicial review that different judges take and try to see if this matches up to their underlying views about the nature of society and the style of judicial reasoning that they take. In the meantime, take care and I'll see you in the next video.